happy and excited and invite you know Professor Thompson Kevin. Um, he is an associate professor of information and computer science at the University of Michigan, and his research explores models, algorithms, and software systems for optimally connecting people with information, especially toward educational goals. His research has been applied to real-world systems ranging from uh, intelligent tutoring systems to commercial web search engines. Um, so Kevin has also pioneered the techniques for using machine learning to model the reading difficulty of text uh, for creating robust search and recommender systems that maximize effective results while minimizing the risk of worst case errors. So today I'm very happy to invite Kevin to be here and give us a talk. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ijohan, for that introduction. Um, just get myself set up here. Okay. Okay, can everybody see my, my uh, slide screen? Not yet. Not yet, no. True. Ah. All right, how about now? Yes, but you might want to. Yeah. Very good. You're good okay. to go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, my privilege to be here with you. Thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about another aspect of document representation, which um, I've been, it's been fascinating to explore over uh, almost 20 years now of work, both small scale and educational settings and larger scale when I was a researcher at, at Microsoft Research. So I'm going to go over some of the insights that I that we, we found. With, uh, with my collaborators um, who are listed here. Um, as you can see, it's a very uh, diverse group from uh, 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 spanning uh, lots of interesting sort of cross-disciplinary uh, areas. Um, and so, yeah, thanks again to the, uh, the workshop organizers for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about this work. Um, so as everybody is well aware, there are you know, lots of different ways that documents can be difficult. You can have, um, you know, documents on a topic that occur at a wide range of reading difficulty levels. And in fact, um, some of the research that I ended up doing was inspired by uh, an episode that happened with my, uh, when she was uh, seven years old, my daughter came home one day and, and she was in tears because she had to do a project on sea urchins and everything she was finding on the web was just too difficult for her to read, and she was very frustrated. <laughs> so that was a pretty good motivation to say, well, okay, what, what, what's going on? What, like, well, how, how could we try to do a better job at, at getting the right information at the right reading level? Um, so, you know, there are lots of different aspects to what makes the document difficult. Um, everything from, you can see these different examples. You know, this is a kid's example about, what insects eat, uh, but there are also, you know, more sort of scientific articles. Um, perhaps this is from later on in high school. There's usually a, a, some sort of diagram that might supplement the, the text, and that's an interesting aspect in itself. And of course, there's lots of academic information um, about, in this case, uh, insect diets. So lots of interesting challenges about different aspects to difficulty. And also, of course, there are lots of different users of, with different ranges of, of proficiency, expertise, background, language background. Um, so this is a very interesting matching problem as well. So uh, not only is it interesting to, to consider how to enrich document representations to capture these different sort of interesting aspects of difficulty, but then how to do the same on the user side and ultimately connect the two uh, together. Um, often for, um, you know, personalized learning, discovery. And I, you know, learning is a, obviously a very broad area. I mean, learning can, enc can encapsulate not just things that happen in a classroom, but you can imagine in a business setting, you know, anytime you're trying to teach someone else <laughs> something, uh, could convey information that's, uh, you know, not just relevant to them, but something that they can actually process um, is when these kinds of problems become important. So, 
Um, my longer term goal is to, you know, I'm fascinated by this idea of having these richer representations of users and documents, especially at web scale. And then given those representations, how can we integrate those into um, search and recommender systems, which happen to be my, my area of focus. And that requires, um, you know, potentially new evaluation measures as well as new algorithms. Uh, and then, you know, looking at the outcomes, we're not just trying to optimize in the case of search engines, you know, precision at five or whatever. We actually want to measure real learning outcomes and not just learning outcomes immediately after a lecture, let's say, but does somebody retain something, you know, six months later? Or perhaps do they become more curious about a topic? So all of these things, these just different outcomes in education need to be considered you know, beyond just the traditional um, retrieval and, and machine learning metrics, and not just uh, in the short term and the long term. And I'm going to show you several examples of where um, machine learning models that we built, um, there was no detectable effect in the short term uh, learning case, but there was a significant effect when, when we went back to students later to see what they retained. And, and, and you know, multiple studies, personalized systems um, ended up showing great increases in long-term retention. And, uh, you know, if we didn't ever have a delayed post-test a, a month or a week later, we would never even have seen that effect. So it's an interesting evaluation angle. Uh, in this talk, I'll be focusing mostly on just, you know, what does it mean to analyze content difficulty and what are the implications? Like, you know, one of the things that we did at Microsoft, we have had access to billions of web pages. What happens when you can label billions of web pages with reading difficulty information? What new capabilities or insights does that allow you to, um, to achieve for understanding and supporting uh, readers? So, um, what makes text difficult to read and understand? This is, you know, people have been studying the problem of text difficulty for arguably for centuries. Uh, in one of the examples I gave, you know, in ancient Greece, uh, it was well known, you know, when somebody was making a legal argument, uh, they could have the most persuasive legal argument in the world, but if, the, uh, if their audience didn't understand it, it wasn't really uh, worth much. And so people have known for a long time that the difficulty is a critical aspect of conveying information, but it wasn't until about 100 years ago that people started systematically trying to develop um, solutions to, to actually take text and do something more quantitative. Uh, and, you know, over time, people have developed this, this sort of pyramid model where you have obviously at the, the very bottom, uh, I'm going to attempt to draw on the slide and see what happens. Um, okay. There we go. So at the very bottom, you have obviously the sort of basic legibility issues. Um, but then as you go up this pyramid, you start looking at more semantic issues. Um, uh, the meaning of, of vocabulary terms, how, how complex is the sentence structure that uses those vocabulary terms? And then at a higher level, is this a coherent argument? Does it make sense? Are things connected? Um, is there an accompanying picture that supports um, information that's being conveyed? Uh, and then, of course, the top, you have lots of highly dependent user aspects to what makes something difficult. So the person's background and, and their motivation can have a big, big effect on, on the difficulty, the perceived uh, difficulty of text. And of course, there are important implications for accessibility too, for example, for dyslexic readers. Um, it's important to be able to model this kind of, you know, these different kinds of difficulties that people face um, to have more accessible information systems. So um, some of you may have heard of some of the existing measures that were in place for a long time, uh, like the flesh Kincaid method that comes with Microsoft Word. If you go into Word and uh, you know, ask it to compute the, the reading level of the document, it uses something like this flesh Kincaid model, which is really simple but very widely used model that, that takes, uh, it counts, um, you know, the average number of words in a sentence um, as a proxy for um, syntactic complexity. And then it looks at the how, you know, using long words, number of syllables per word as a, as a proxy for how, you know, semantic difficulty and it combines them into a little formula. Um, this was, you know, invented in the 1940s. Uh, uh, 
but and it gives you know it gives it does something <laughs> it gives you a um american grade level um and it was you know as i said it's been used for a long time and you know it, it's great for you have documents where the content has well-formed sentences uh, where you've got lots and lots of sort of vanilla text chapters and so forth um, but uh, when you start looking at things like uh, the web or other kind of non-traditional sources of content where things are noisy, less structured, um, and, and beyond the web, things like health questionnaires and surveys and so forth that have important public health implications. All these things don't match the sort of traditional large amounts of uh, vanilla text requirement. Um, and, uh, and then additionally, if you want to sort of do some kind of interesting analysis of difficulty, um, you have to have something that, that can run on uh, billions of pages very, very quickly. You can't necessarily, you don't have time necessarily to you know, do deep, deep uh, NLP uh, modeling if you're trying to run in a, a search pipeline, for example. So um, my, some of my earliest work um, was the first to um, really explore uh, statistical machine learning approaches that go way beyond what these flesh concave models do. Um, to more uh, fi very fine-grained um, vocabulary-based uh, prediction models. Um, and so in our first, the first paper with my advisor, Jamie Callan, we had just very, very simple generative models. We collected a bunch of training data at different grade levels, and we looked, we computed uh, unigram language models, and we smoothed them in particular ways, both within the grade uh, and across the grade levels. Um, so really, really simple uh, just to start with. Um, and it turned out that that did reasonably well on general English things. And so we, it was a nice, simple model. So it was easy to analyze where it was successful and how it was failing. Um, but you could, with this generative model, the great thing was it didn't require a huge amount of training data and it gave reasonable uh, likelihood estimates. So if you have a grade eight document, it would give you a nice you could, you could compute a posterior distribution and you could take, you know, something like the, the maximum likelihood. And um, so that was actually surprisingly effective on a range of different corpora. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you take, if you build these uh, unigram models of grade levels, then you can do something like, okay, you can ask, um, what are the um, significant terms in each grade that sort of are most distinctive and does this does this match what we would expect? Um, and so, if you if you sort of compute a sort of Fisher information like statistic for these features, um, you see that even with these fairly simplistic models, you get something that you know it it, it, uh, it extracts things that are you know short, concrete words for lower grade levels. Um, you can see that in grade eight it talks about uh, scientific terms. You can see that the terms are getting they start off concrete and there's sort of a divide that happens where from concrete words to more abstract terms. And then by the time you get to grade 12, some of the most indicative terms are, are very sort of highly literary terms that, um, that you would expect as, as the material moves from stories and talking about the world to more, to more um, abstract um, literary types of things. Um, so the, the good news was this, 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 these sort of generative models were very uh, reasonably successful. Um, but then we did some further exploration on uh, what I call model two, um, which is joint work with Paul Kidwell and, and Guy Lebanon. We published this, um, the Journal of American Statistical Association at NMNOP. Um, this took a step beyond um, the, the word unigram model that we had in the initial model. We really um, tried to model a phenomenon of what's known as age of acquisition. So what, at what point does a person, as they're seeing sort of typical sets of documents go through, as they go through time <laughs> and seeing typical content, at what point do they acquire the likely meaning of these terms? Um, and so um, there was already a reading level method that attempted to do this for content called the Dale Chaw method that was developed in the 1940s, where they had a list of, of 3,000 words that 80% of fourth graders in the United States um, were familiar to them. And so this, this model is sort of a much nice, much, much more general, nice generalization of that. So um, where we try to learn 
um, from, so we have a set of training documents where, uh, you know, we have a set of grade levels. Let's say this is a set of grade levels from one to 12. Um, and then a particular document might, we might have some training data that says, okay, at grade levels, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's not readable, but then after a certain point, the document becomes readable. So if you have lots of training data like that, you can then learn um, for each word approximately when in the population pe people will, will, will likely um, learn that word if, if you're told that these documents are readable uh, after a certain grade. And so the, the nice thing about this model was that we're able to discuss readability in terms of um, you know, what population of people uh, at that population um, will know the word if it's familiar, or, and then how much of a document, how many, what percentage of the words in a document have to be familiar uh, before it's considered readable. That's the, the second S parameter. Um, so I won't go into the, the details of the statistics, but I'll show you an example of how this works. So with the training data, you imagine you've estimated that, that, that children see the word red. Uh, on average, they're, they learn it, you know, somewhere between first and fourth grade. You can estimate, a, this is just a Gaussian uh, for each, uh, for, for the word red. And 80% of kids um, for the word red, by the, by the time you reach a grade three and a half, um, it'll be known to 80% of kids. And uh, if you have a, a two word document like red perimeter, you can say, okay, at, oh, as you scan through over time, uh, how does the, fraction of words that are known to the population increase from zero to one. And so you get a sort of a rough um, cumulative uh, distribution of, um, of readability. Then you can say, okay, uh, at what age do we reach 70%? Uh, so at what age do 70% of the words become familiar to 80% to of the population? And that turns out in this case to be eight point, grade 8.8. .8. And then you can do something uh, you know, with more words, um, and you get a little bit more, um, slightly longer document, uh, looks like this. Um, but this, is, this provides a very nice way to learn. So again, the, the goal here is to, given that training data, you, we're learning these, the mean and the standard deviations for each word about when people are likely to have acquired it. Um, and we use, a, you can do that with max, some tweaking, you can do a maximum likelihood approach to estimate those parameters. And um, so that, that method turned out to be even more accurate um, than our first model. Um, and one of the fun things about this model was that we were able to use it not just to compute um, the, the global readability of a document, but also the local readability. So not just the, a single number or, or posterior distribution for the entire thing, but take a sliding window and move it through some document to see how readability might change as you Go look at different parts of the document. So maybe you might want to see a part of the document that's like a hotspot that's really difficult or you might want to flag that for review or something. Uh, you could even imagine doing that with a, a lecture, a transcript and so forth. Um, one example we used in our American Statistical Association paper was I took the matrix reloaded script, just raw, <laughs> the raw script, and I ran it through the, um, the local readability for the uh, for model two. Um, and you can see that it, it, it does a good job of identifying um, interesting events. <clears throat> so it turns out that um, whenever Keanu Reeves enters a scene, uh, the, the readability level plummets to the lowest possible level. <laughs> that's a fairly consistent phenomenon. Uh, but then it's also things like there's a scene that's in French and there's this famous uh, architect speech at the end. So this, this kind of reveals how modeling difficulty um, sort of allows you to see a different perspective on a document that you might otherwise miss. Uh, and, and as I said, um, you know, as we look at the increasing accuracy of these models um, with more refinement, we were able to get uh, better and better results. Uh, and I've explored, uh, you know, d different aspects uh, to readability uh, over time with my, with my collaborators. Um, it's a really fascinating problem that involves everything from crowdsourcing to deeper NLP. So I looked at, I just described something based on vocabulary, but of course um, there are estimates of, of syntax. Uh, people have developed this area um, in a really nice way 
uh, over the past uh, 15 years to include lots of interesting features about text complexity. Um, and if you go to my website, I wrote um, a survey of read readability, computational readability research. Um, it's a little bit out of date now, it's about five years old, but, um, but it has a, a good summary for, for how the field has, has exploited uh, and progress in NLP to, uh, to, to get really richer representations of documents. So um, that's sort of a, a summary of how sort of more robust um, prediction methods work um, for web pages and things. But what happens if you actually then, as I said at the beginning of the talk, suppose we have billions of web pages and we label them, um, what does that allow us to do? Um, well, we were able to do a little bit of that at, at Microsoft Research, uh, and it, it leads to a whole bunch of interesting things. So, um, of course, for individual for sets of documents, you can see on a particular website um, how the reading level and the, the variance um, change across sites to see is this a is the reading level consistent or not across pages of a site. Um, you know, you can look at individual documents to see okay. Are there particular words somebody would need to learn to make this document more readable to them? But then once you combine um, these uh, rich representations of content with interaction behavior, you can start building user profiles and say, okay, looking, looking at the reading level of, of what somebody clicks on, what they visit and so forth to help improve that matching that I said was one of the goals um, earlier on. Um, so it's kind of fun. So if you have billions of pages where you have these, these estimates of readability, um, you can do fun things like you could do a search for quantum theory uh, and you get, you know, in this case, um, uh, typical just top results without accounting for reading level. But then I can ask for things like, uh, you know, do a search for quantum theory, but ask for really uh, low difficulty documents. It turns out that quantum theory is a game. Uh, quantum theory is a cocktail, apparently. So you, 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 there's an interesting sort of topic shift problem that happens, uh, disambiguation, um, if, you, if you just don't control for topic. But then you can do things like add back in the science constraints. So now you can search for quantum theory at a lower level of difficulty, um, but, but keeping it focused on science. So that actually lets you find, not just, you know, you don't find the Wikipedia article on quantum theory anymore. You actually find some interesting blogs that are targeted at a broader audience. Um, and so by adding these, um, these representations of difficulty, you increase the space that you can navigate around in to find uh, appropriate content. Uh, yeah, I, I did this for a, a few different words just for fun. So <laughs> Cinderella is apparently a Java-based interactive geometry tool if you dial up the difficulty level. Um, Bambi is uh, you know, is a scientific project called the Bambi Radio Telescope. So anyway, so that's kind of a, a fun example, but um, we did a lot more deeper analysis of large amounts of web traffic based on readability. Uh, and so we we used it, for example, to model uh, user and site expertise. Uh, so how can we classify a site about financial stuff? Is it an expert site or a non-expert site? Uh, and we found that, uh, you know, using reading level and topic together allowed us to much better distinguish um, the expert sites in, in computer science and, and the legal domain and so forth, um, rather than just using either one alone. We we're also able to see um, you know, examples because we had search logs, uh, when did people really dramatically deviate from their typical reading level profile? So they started looking for things that were much more difficult than average. Um, and so they, we sort of did the taxonomy of different tasks, uh, things like medical tests. Um, healthcare was a big one, um, looking up uh, health information for prescriptions and, and so forth. So again, because we had this reading level information for pages, we were able to build reading level profiles for users and then understand maybe when they were struggling with something, uh, looking for things that were much more difficult than they were used to. And so identifying and predicting those tasks is an interesting uh, ongoing uh, problem. Um, another interesting thing that we noted, once we had the reading level content uh, representations, we noticed that um, there's, there was often a difference in search results between what the snippet promised in terms of the reading difficulty and what the page actually was. So in this case, um, the snippet was sort of a medium difficulty, but the page was a high level of difficulty. 
Um, and so but then we looked at what, what users did in that situation. And we found that if you look at this sector down here, this is a sector where the, the, the page is much harder than the result snippet promised. Um, and so the, the y-axis here is the dwell time. How long did they stay on the page in seconds? Uh, and so, and this, what we call the SAT threshold, this 30 second threshold is if they stay uh, on the page longer for 30 seconds, they typically, we call that a satisfied click simplistically. Um, but you can see here uh, as the reading level difference uh, got, got higher, there was a, they consistently abandoned the page more and more quickly. Um, which was really interesting because that suggests that there's an issue, a basic issue with the ranker. Um, the snippet difficulty shouldn't really match the underlying uh, document difficulty. And indeed, it turned out that um, when, when a feature was added to the ranker to correct for this, uh, this applied to all you know, pages in general relevance, it was a highly effective um, improvement ranking. Um, and then Along those lines, we, we also have looked at um, using all those things we learned about reading level to then do that final uh, matching with the users. And so we, we in, the, in our CAKM 2011 paper, we published um, a simple uh, model for uh, how you can um, do content and uh, user matching by incorporating reading level features. So the user profiles are very, again, very simple uh, generative models. If somebody is searching for grasshoppers and they're clicking on documents, um, we have the, the posterior distribution of, of reading levels for each document, so we can accumulate those over time to, to develop um, you know, approximately. Of course, we have the topics for these two, so if we wanted to, we could separate out, we could have per topic uh, readability to see if somebody was an expert uh, in a particular topic or not, at least according to the simplistic uh, reading level uh, estimates. So with, with these uh, user models, we're able to construct a bunch of features. Um, we, had, we had the content features from the page reading level and the snippet. We had reading level information about uh, the query terms, um, their session and user model uh, history. And then um, of course, all the interactions of those features. Um, and so it, we tur you know, it turned out to actually be reasonably successful for things like science queries, where there's actually is a, a broad range of uh, things on a particular topic at different levels. And so, um, you know, we were able to uh, improve, at least for this set of a few million queries, a few hundred thousand queries, sorry, um, uh, you know, about between one and 2% of all the queries, we were able to move a satisfied click uh, up about one rank position. Um, so that was a, we considered that to be a promising um, initial result, especially given that we didn't do a lot of tuning of the models and they were fairly uh, simplistic. Um, and so, um, yeah, we, we were able to, to, to say that about half the game came from general, the general relevance features and half came from roughly uh, the personalization, the user model based features. Now, more recently, we've been um, extending this idea about uh, optimal rankings to creating search engines that look, sort of try to consider the results uh, at, from the point of view of the user. So you, people, you know, we all have different cognitive strengths, weaknesses, biases. And so um, our, our goal in more recent work, and our, we have a, a paper at SIG IR in 2017 um, with this model, uh, is can we, can we create an optimization problem and solve it approximately that gives a ranking that's, that gives the best results from, from the point of view of somebody learning material, uh, that need, somebody who needs exposure to multiple documents, um, documents that are at the right level, that are supportive and so forth. And so we did a study on vocabulary learning. So people who are learning new technical terms um, from different fields of science. And uh, the goal was for people to read articles, um, learn terms like igneous and magma from context uh, and then, um, you know, test to see whether different personalization strategies in search were effective at, at, at that simple, very interesting learning, just vocabulary learning problem. Um, and so we created this system, which I won't go into detail on, 
uh, there's a, you know, the expert model, the teacher, the teacher says uh, what, what would be great to learn. Um, the student model says what they know already. And then you have this problem of, okay, how can I find documents that um, take, given where I am in the student model uh, over here, um, you know, this is the goal over here. You know, different, if I show the student different documents, that'll take them, you know, in different directions toward new information. And we want to get them towards what the teacher has said is important. So it leads to this optimization problem. Um, how am I doing for time? Um, so we, we introduced this, this optimization problem where the search engine was, was, was try, trying to both uh, advance a user toward their learning goal by giving them the right documents, but also by minimizing or reducing the effort that it, they had to expend um, to get to that goal as measured by um, the difficulty of the documents and the, the time it would take to, to read and so forth. And so again, I won't go into all the details of the optimization problem this work was inspired in part by, by the work um, from Jerry Ju's group on machine teaching. Um, we basically instantiated a sort of machine teaching like problem where you search for this optimal set that maximizes learning effectiveness and minimizes the effort. And to do that, it, you know, the actual optimization problem is pretty, <laughs> pretty hard, but it turns out that you can break it down into sort of approximately optimal um, steps. Um, you can, uh, you know, figure out um, what, the, what the global characteristics are for the words and the dif difficulty of them. And then you can create a greedy algorithm that then will uh, find um, you know, the documents that satisfy those sufficient statistics for, for the total sort of the impact, all, all the different words they need to learn. You can find a set of documents that covers uh, those um, pretty well. And so this is a case where it was really good that we did a, um, a delay post-test because um, it turns out that we saw significantly better learning outcomes than generic search, um, especially for when we looked at how people remembered material um, a week later instead of um, right after. Um, and we had a similar result in, in some other studies, including a, a paper at uh, CHEER um, 2018. Um, but this is a, a case where we had a personalized um, user model that, that knew that, you know, what the students had already known in the past. And, um, so with the personalized model, we were able to um, get significant gains um, in, in, in long-term retention um, compared to you know, commercial web search or um, a non-personalized version of our, our algorithm. And then finally, um, in, in more recent work, we've been using gaze tracking to kind of get at the issue of difficulty and try to develop um, understand when people are having difficulty with something, um, what have they skimmed versus what have they read, and how can some how can a system help them um, get more insight into um, a document by, by understanding and supporting their reading. So um, this is joint work with colleagues at Microsoft Research. It was published at the web conference um, in 2020. And so we basically combined a gaze classifier that tracks the fixations you make when you read individual words. Uh, along with a question generator. So this is a well-known education asking adjunct questions can be really beneficial for somebody reading it, has them, you know, gets them to reflect on what they've been reading and so forth. Um, and so um, we're looking at um, skimming content behaviors based on how many fixations per word they make in a content window. So you can see that in this particular example, you know, a person might have skimmed the first few paragraphs, maybe because they were more familiar or less interesting, and then they they read in detail this more this this paragraph down here um, about the landing broadcast, and so this can all be quantified with um, this fixation um, model that we used, uh, and then we can we can ask the questions appropriately. So we can say, okay, this person skimmed a particular paragraph. We can ask them a question about that. Um, maybe to encourage them to read more about it. Um, and so we studied this. Um, we, we did a fairly detailed user study, um, both to, in, to just look at the effectiveness of questions, but also whether this gaze behavior, this difficulty aspect could be used to, to predict if people were learning the material or would, would learn the material well or not. 
Um, and so this is a summary of the results of the paper. Um, most of the effects that we saw, the key effects were in the long-term retention. People were- Sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, so asking people adjunct questions definitely improved their performance, especially for low knowledge learners who are, are people with who didn't have very much knowledge of the topic uh, before they did the study. That's what a, a low knowledge learner is. So questions helped. Um, the automatic questions were actually just as good as the, we had a human generated questions. And then also um, this using the, the, the gaze information actually helped us um, help their grade. So if we focus questions on things that they skimmed, naturally they uh, ended up learning more about those sections and uh, did better on the tests overall. Um, so, and the gaze behavior was actually uh, reasonably well um, associated with how well they did on test behavior. So the idea is that it could be used to predict um, of what they read, whether they were likely to have retained, will, will retain that or not. So just in, in summary, um, so th that sort of describes um, the, an array of work on content difficulty that my collaborators and I have done over the past few years, um, but we were actively working on some, some next steps. So we're looking at domain specific uh, personalized measures of difficulty. Um, not all difficulty is bad. So often to learn, as we all know, it's often good to struggle a little bit. So there's a well-known concept in, in cognitive psychology, the College of Science uh, called desirable difficulty. So can we detect when does difficulty and content desirable versus not? Um, uh, there's lots of interesting work, and I think some of the OCR work and other things that have been discussed here um, will be really interesting to apply to educational videos. That's an area I'm currently very interested in. Can we uh, look at the complexity and difficulty of videos and their effect on learning? And then finally, um, one of my students and I have been looking at deep learning models of contextual informativeness. So how well does a sentence contain information about a particular thing? How well does that paragraph or sentence help you learn a particular concept? Is it, is it support um, learning about that thing? And in particular, can, can the model explain uh, why that thing is, uh, what, you know, why this, this paragraph was recommended versus another one? Um, so those are four areas we're, we're currently looking at. Um, the, some of the models that we have described are available uh, now uh, as a REST API for non-commercial use at uh, api.discover.org. Um, and there's documentation on the website in case you want to try them out. There's some sample code from, for Python. Um, so yeah, so, so content difficulty is a fascinating dimension to content representation that I think is really important for a lot of applications, um, you know, because learning, human learning is, is you know, encompasses so much interesting behavior. And, um, so, you know, developing rich representations, um, integrating those uh, models of human learning into search and recommender systems is something I think is really exciting. Uh, and then continuing to develop, uh, you know, explicit, implicit uh, assessment of difficulty uh, and learning and discovery and curiosity uh, I think is a, a very promising area. And especially, as I said, um, focusing on things that help people long-term, not just uh, some, you know, with a short-term uh, short user study. Um, that's, how, that's, uh, that's what I have. <laughs> um, please feel free to contact me if you have uh, any questions about the work. I'd be happy to get in touch. And um, as I said, yeah, the readability API is there as well if you wanna check that out. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Kevin. Uh, actually, we already run out of time, but uh, uh, yeah, I think we still can have up to three questions to Kevin. If anybody have any question, welcome to talk with Kevin. Next yeah. session, we should have enough time because there are only four papers there. So yeah, we still have some chance to talk with Kevin. Anybody have any question? Yes, I had a question. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, inter annotated agreement, like well, what is the human agreed upon thing on readability and difficulty? And the other thing was the frequency of terms. The, you said multisyllable terms. Does frequency also uh, predict, uh, correlate with uh, uh, the prior uh, occurrence of a term? I guess it, that's more domain specific, but yeah, I was wondering whether that can also predict difficulty. Thank you. 
Um, yeah. So, so if in the um, in the uh, in our in the Journal of American Statistical Association paper, uh, Kidwell, Lebanon, and Colin Thompson, I talk a bit about the um, some of the inter interrater. Um, were, it's, it's surprisingly, there wasn't a lot actually in, in literature on on that. But um, in general, I think th there have been some studies that indicate. Um, you know, you get a bunch of experts. So we, in fact, for many of our studies, we had experts validate the predictions that were made by our models. We had we had um, teachers of reading and so forth um, validate. And I think I think in general, people agreed within about um, grade level. <laughs> um, I don't have I don't remember the exact um, inter-rater reliability statistic, uh, but I think the machine learning models that we have now are, are getting are, are getting pretty close to to what humans to the human level. Um, so the challenge now is to is to make make the models more interpretable and to to make them more sensitive to other interesting kinds of difficulty. Um, and then the second question, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get you asking about multi-word phrases. Uh, uh, yeah, no. Uh, for terms, is the frequency uh, of the term also is it predictive rather than the multi-syllable aspects of terms for difficulty? I would assume it is, but I guess it doesn't go as far. If the term is low frequency, uh, so, so there's the something called the, yeah, there's something called the type token ratio. Which is um, like uh, um, how many how many tokens are there, but also you look at how many what's the diversity of words. So how many different word classes are there, you know? But also, uh, so but what's the density of new word classes? That's that's fairly predictive. That's a standard baseline. Um, but but the difference between that and what some what these models do is eat the, the machine model learning models we have learn learn about individual terms across a whole set of levels. So they have individual word models so that makes them a lot more uh, robust. Um, you can apply them to very short texts more reliably and things like that. So, so yes, frequency and like type type token ratio and things like that are 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 somewhat predictive. Um, but but um, those are still general statistics that don't capture individual word or term um, behavior. I guess. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful talk. Thanks. Fascinating. Thank you, Ben. I see you raise your hand. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, so wonderful talk. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so I understand the uh, readability assessment is based on tokens. Uh, have you uh, or anyone uh, worked on, you know, modality? Like um, there are a lot of times when I read a paper, I just wish the author just put a figure or a chart or even table uh, somewhere just to uh, go over the content. That will be easier. Yeah, there has been some work on. So I, I saw a, a paper. I'm. And I'm. Uh, I don't have the. Um, I'm sorry. I don't have the authors um, on the tip of my brain. But but basically, there have been people recently have looked at things like you know you, you say a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> is that actually true uh, in the sense of giving information about something? So I think. I mean, there's a lot of work in traditional education about the value of of supplemental uh, material different and presenting things in different modalities for sure. Um, I'm not as aware of work that's been done like computationally to, to, I, I think that's something that maybe this workshop could, as it's inspired me to look at some of the work that I've seen already, um, to think about, to, to do exactly as you said, to take, to take, um, you know, the, the entire entirety of a document, the layout and, and the, um, the different sections and so forth, um, into consideration. So there hasn't been, to my knowledge, as much work in that, in that area. Thank you. And sorry about running out of over time. I, I, I lost my... Um, no, it's not your time. fault. It's, uh, yeah, it's, right. So Kevin, can I have maybe the last question? Yeah, yeah, I know you did a lot of work, you know, modeling the content difficulty, uh, you know, um, based on the human learning. So I'm just curious is, um, is there any, any work or did you do any research regarding to, you know, modeling the content difficulty for computer learning? Do you, are they consistent with each other or there's some, you know, a different thing? Maybe some document, human feel easy, but if it, but computer feel hard, you know, some documents, human feel hard, but computer feel easy. So, yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. I just want to consult with you. That is a, that's a great question. Uh, and in fact, we, we have done some, so we have done up some work on, um, on machine readers. Um, and, and it's not published yet. It's in, it's it's being reviewed right now. But but yes, that's exactly right. 
a lot of the um, frameworks that we've developed for human readers can be applied to, to machine reading, for example. Um, so the paper that we've submitted, um, we, we, we use difficulty measures and um, things like that to, um, to, to, uh, to, do curric to, to investigate curriculum learning. Right, where in curriculum learning, you you have a classifier and you give the you know you give the uh, you start by giving it the easy examples, right, and then you give it harder and harder examples. That's exactly um, yes, you're absolutely right, and and uh, I hope to be able to share that paper um, <laughs> uh, soon. But we we got we got um, reasonably good results by by using difficulty uh, well by using informativeness as um, to help do curriculum learning for machine readers. So we, we, we hope that will come out soon. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to that paper. Okay, let us thanks again to, to Kevin. Uh, you really give us, uh, you know, a great talk and I have learned a lot in today's talk. Okay.